masterfully. The ancient Essenes uh, perhaps identified best the, uh, the role of, of our personal relationships and uh, categorize them. They went so far as to actually categorize seven mysteries of relationship that we would live, each individual through the course of, of their lives would live uh, simply by living life in the presence of one another. They have categorized these as mirrors and what they remind us of is that in each moment of our life the reality that we have become within is mirrored to us. It is a reflected reality. It is mirrored to us by the actions and the choices and the language of those around us. The first mirror of those relationships is a mirror uh, of our presence in the moment. It's the mystery of the first mirror, what it is that we reflect to those around us in the moment. When we find ourselves surrounded by individuals and patterns of relationship and behavior uh, with a dominant uh, aspect of anger or rage or fear perhaps, and the mirror works both ways, it could just as easily be joy and ecstasy and, and happiness in our lives. If the fir first mirror is, uh, is at play, what we're seeing is a mirror of that which we are in the moment, that's which we are radiating to those individuals around us as they mirror or shine back to us that which has been offered, the mirror of, uh, of that which we are in the moment. The second mirror of relationship uh, is of a similar quality, although it's a little more subtle. Rather than mirroring to us what we are in the moment, the second mirror mirrors to us that which we judge in the moment. If you should find yourself surrounded by individuals who demonstrate patterns of behavior uh, that perhaps uh, frustrate you, push your buttons of anger or rage, and you sense that those are not your patterns, they're not you in the moment, you ask yourself, are they showing me me in this moment? And you say, honestly to yourself, no, then there's a, a good possibility they may be showing you that which you judge in the moment, the anger and the rage or the joy that you, uh, that you are judging in that moment. When you find many different people demonstrating the same patterns to you, uh, many different people demonstrating their anger, their rage to you, have you ever been angry and been in a big hurry to get somewhere and gotten into your car to drive to wherever it was you were going and found that everywhere you went you made the wrong choices. You made the wrong choice in, in, the, uh, in the teller line at the bank. You chose the slow line. You made the wrong choice on the exit ramp on the freeway. And everywhere when you're driving down the road uh, you're seeing people that are pulling out in front of you and then doing about 30 miles an hour in a 55. They may be mirroring to you what you are in that moment. We're going to talk about a reflected reality in just a few moments, a reflected reality. Often, the mystery of the first mirror is precisely what's happening. Often we will find uh, people in our presence who are mirroring to us that which we are in the moment, and often that's not the case. And then people say, well, the mirrors don't work. Well, they do work if we have the wisdom to recognize what it is they're saying. A few years ago, I had the opportunity, a rare opportunity, to have three people come into my life in the same month. Now, that should have been my clue right there. When three brand new relationships, very different in nature, all occur within the same month, that's, that's the flag that says something's going to happen here. You better believe it. One of them was... Uh, a potentially a romantic relationship, one of them was potentially a business relationship, and one was uh, a, a mix between a business and a relationship and a friendship. Each of them came into my life, each of them came to me, and that's to have been the second clue. Each of them found me. Um, the romantic relationship, it was with someone who I, I had worked with, we had spent a lot of time together, we had a lot of common interests, and it was one of those things where it just kind of made sense to be together. It wasn't like 
uh, there wasn't a powerful magnetic attraction. It was, it was more, uh, it just seemed like the thing to do. The business relationship was especially interesting for me. I was very busy doing seminars uh, more than full time. It's like, like we are now. And, uh, and there was a gentleman that came to me and, uh, and offered to do the logistics and to set these, these seminars up, allowing me, freeing me up to do, uh, to do the things that I was choosing to do more of and, uh, and allowing him to do the things that he did best. Sounded like a, a, a good plan for me to do that. And the, the friendship uh, and kind of uh, quasi-business relationship, there was a gentleman a very talented, very skilled carpenter uh, who asked uh, if he could house it on my property in northern New Mexico while I was leading a group to Egypt uh, in the late fall. And I had been looking for someone to stay on the property, and it, it looked like a, uh, also a good thing to do. He said that he would like to stay at that property uh, in exchange for his carpentry and, and caretake. And, and so all of these happened right about the same time. It was a very, very busy time in, in my life. And I said, uh, I said, okay, sure. Well, within that month, within the same month that each of those three people came into my life, each of them just about uh, began to make me crazy. They were just driving me right up, uh, up the wall. And there's a pattern that I had demonstrated throughout much of my life. When things were making me crazy, we call it crazy making, when things were doing that for me, I would use logic. And through my logic, I'd say, oh, Greg, you're just, you're just tired. You know, you've been on the road a lot. Um, you know, you're under a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure right now. Let's see how it is another week or so, or see how it is in a couple of weeks. And I would go away, I did this with these people, and I'd go away on the trip, and then I'd come back in a week or 10 days, and, uh, and everything was the same, and I, I did this uh, again and again. Well, there's a routine that I would do at that time in my life. When I would uh, travel on uh, a trip like this, I would come back to the Albuquerque airport. I'd stop at the ATM, pull out uh, some cash, pull my animals out of the vet, get the car out of parking, fill up the car, and, and drive approximately four hours to our home in northern New Mexico. And on this one particular trip, uh, I came home and I began that, um, that routine, and, and I didn't get very far with it. Because I, uh, I went to the ATM, 5 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in Albuquerque Airport, and the ATM machine told me uh, there was nothing in that account. And I knew that it was a mistake. I knew that the, the account was, uh, was full because I'd just been approved for a construction loan. It was a, a business construction loan on my property in northern New Mexico and that there was plenty of money there, and I would check it Monday morning. So I uh, drove home, and... Um, Monday morning, sure enough, I got up and I called the bank, and they said, well, there's no mistake, Mr. Braden. Uh, not only is there no money in this account, uh, you are overdrawn by 71 checks, and there's a uh, $30 service charge in each of those checks. When can you come in and talk to us? I said, well, I'll be right there. And one of those checks was to my dear friend, Jeff Volk, and that, that's how we met. So now Jeff gets the story. <laughs> Because Jeff had trusted me and sent me a video. I'm sorry, Jeff. I really <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went to the bank and I said, well, what's happening? They said, well, there was a wire, uh, a wire withdrawal um, from your account. It was not authorized. I, it was not authorized by me, and they believed that it was. And, uh, and every penny in that account had been taken, and all the checks had already been written outstanding were, were now uh, coming back against that account. And when something like that happens, uh, there's really no way to rationalize anything else. You can't do anything else. So I, I didn't even have enough money to put gas in my car and get my animals out of the vet. There was absolutely nothing that was there. And I had to go home and look at this. I said, wow, something, is, something big is happening here. Well, at the same time, uh, I had just completed a, a tour, a series of workshops uh, along the Pacific Northwest uh, for about, uh, about 30 days. And the, the people who had offered to set these programs up for me um, had many reasons why the money from those programs wouldn't come through. They said, well, our accounting isn't done, or we haven't reconciled our, our accounts, or, you know, whatever. So, something was happening. And at the, at the same time, uh, the gentleman who was living on my property in exchange for the, the carpentry, and this is really very delicate for me, and I have to be really careful. I, I guess the best way to identify this 
is that he had, he had chosen a lifestyle that uh, not only was what our property was not about, it was illegal in the eyes of the state of New Mexico at that time, and I was asking him to, to change his lifestyle. Was that delicate? That was good. So all these, things, all these things were happening at the same time. And I said, if the mirrors hold true, obviously there are some mirrors that are happening to me. Uh, what are these mirrors saying to me? Well, I went for a walk. I couldn't do much else. I, I mean, I, actually, I, I had to go for a walk that day. There's a beautiful road that goes about four miles from our home down to the, the Rio Grande Gorge, a beautiful uh, wildlife sanctuary. I went for a walk down the road that day. Um, there's a huge mountain. It's called Ute Peak. Uh, there are a lot of stories from the Ute Indians about what this mountain. Uh, it's a very sacred mountain. It marks the end of their hunting grounds. And I often walk along this road in front of this mountain. I've written whole books, done entire workshops on this road, and I have to go home and put them in, in the computer. And, uh, and I asked myself this question. I said, if, if these mirrors hold true, then there's a mirror that's happening here. What are these people showing to me? And I knew that I had to find a common thread. So I began looking at what each of these relationships w was demonstrating. And I, I went through all kinds of possibilities. And when it was all said and done, what I knew that in each relationship, I knew that there were issues of honesty, integrity, and trust were the three that were really the most outstanding for me. And so I said to myself, if this mirror holds true, if, if people that are around me are demonstrating these patterns of behavior, are they showing me that I somehow am lacking in honesty, as Jeff may have thought, <laughs> or integrity, or trust? Is that what they're showing me? And this feeling welled up inside of me before I even got that, that sentence out of my head and said, no, that's what this work is all about. That's precisely what this work is all about. And at the same time, there was a realization. It was such a powerful, it was subtle and powerful that came to me. And I realized that they were not showing me a mirror of what I was in the moment as we'd always been conditioned, as I'd been conditioned to believe. Rather, they were showing me a more subtle mirror, the mirror of what I judged in that moment. The mirror of what I judged in that moment. And that's precisely what was happening. I had a tremendous charge on honesty and integrity and trust. Such a charge that I was not willing to allow it in others. I was not willing to allow that in others. When you have a charge on something, what does that promise? Promises that you'll see it. You'll see it in your life if you've got a charge on it. I had that charge. These three people that came into my life, now I know that each of them was a powerful, skillful master that impeccably held the mirror to me during that time in my life of my greatest charges. And it was relatively concise the way they did that. It could have drawn out over years. And maybe it did. Maybe those mirrors had been shown to me year after year on such subtle levels that I never recognized them. And they became less subtle and less subtle and less subtle until something happened that I could not look away from. And in that moment, I had that mirror. In that moment, I was shown the second a scene mystery of relationship, the mirror of that which we judge in the moment. The gentleman that had invited me to work with him uh, wanted to set up these, these seminars. The very first moment we met, something interesting happened. We met in the home of a mutual friend in, uh, in Northern California. And the first moment we met, I'd never seen him before. I'd spoken with him on the phone. And our eyes met on the landing of... Uh, of this house, and I said something to him that I, I seldom, or rarely, will ask anyone upon first meeting him, and I simply said, when's your birthday? And he said, well, my birthday is June 28th, 1954. And I said, wow, that's my birthday, the exact month, the exact day, and the exact year. I'm a Cancerian. If you know much about Cancerians, you know that Cancerians uh, live in a world of feeling. Maybe that's why we're exploring feelings this weekend. Uh, and I'm a double Cancerian, which means double feeling, and depending on how you run the charts, I've got five or six planets in the twelfth house that are all in Cancer. So my world is a very feeling world. 
And my path has been to reconcile that feeling world with the academics and the hard sciences through, uh, through the, uh, the corporate and the, uh, um, and the academic, academic world. And I, I looked at him and I said, well, you must have had the same experiences then. Another Cancerian male. What a great person to, to share this business with. And he said something to me in that moment. He looked me directly in the eyes and he said something to me and I discounted it. I used my logic and what he said to me was, ha, huh, I'm your evil twin. And I dis he told me in that moment and I discounted it. Because my logic said, oh, well, he's just making a joke. Although I had a feeling in here. The moment the gentleman moved onto my property to caretake for me in exchange for him living there, I had a feeling about him being there, and I discounted that feeling through my logic. I said, oh, Greg, you don't really even know that man. Well, that's precisely the point. <laughs> you don't even know him. Why would you judge him? The moment that I began uh, spending serious time with the potentially romantic relationship in my life, I had a feeling. And my logic said, oh, that's the feeling that you had from the last time you got hurt. So let's give this one a chance. And the reason I'm sharing this with you now is because in each of these, there was a feeling that told me right up front. And there was more than one lesson that happened here. And I've shared this with other people, and it's, it's uh, been a powerful trigger for them. It's a lesson I didn't care for at the time. The week that I recognized the pattern of judgment, the week that I recognized that each of these people was masterfully mirroring for me the things that I judged in life, every other relationship that was held in place by judgment began to disappear. There's a cascading effect. And I share this with you now because I know that it works this way. If you are experiencing a pattern in one place in your life, it'll show up in other places in your life. And once it is healed, once it's reconciled in one place, it is healed everywhere simultaneously because we are holographic in nature. Our consciousness works that way. It is mirrored on many, many different levels. Well, the, uh, the gentleman who had offered to do the business with me, that relationship didn't work well at all. And I felt like I gave it ample opportunity. And, and the reality is it did work well, and I just didn't know what it was showing me. It worked perfectly as my mirror. So one day I called this gentleman and I said, uh, uh, I'm not going to work with you any longer. And I hung up the phone. There's more to it than that. I'm making a long story short. I hung up the phone, and as I did, I realized that every program and every, uh, every source of income that I had for the next six months, I had, just, I had just canceled. As my hand was on the phone, that was on a Saturday afternoon. So I had the rest of Saturday and all of Sunday to think about it. Sunday night, there was a message on my voice machine from a woman I had never met before who, through mutual friends, had heard about these workshops, and uh, she asked me to call her, and I did. And she said, uh, I'm interested in sponsoring you and setting up programs for you around the country. Would you be interested in working with me? And the first thing I asked her, I said, well, when's your birthday? <laughs> she said, June 28th, 1954. Oh. True story. And my first reaction was to hang up the phone, <laughs> and I didn't do it. And I shared with her, I said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> and I shared with her this story. And she said, well, would you be willing to give this a chance? This time, I paid attention to the way that I felt, and it felt different. Something was different. And I said, um, I said yes, I I'd like to do this with you. If you know her, now she's a seminar coordinator and does workshops in her own right, and now an author uh, of a couple of different books. Uh, her name is Joanne Carl Cornog, if you've ever done any work with Joanne Cornog. Uh, and because I did not allow the first relationship to taint the second, because I was able to trust the feeling and really know what the feeling was saying, we've had a very powerful uh, relationship, and it was through her that I met Melissa. So it's interesting how these things work out. Through that mirror, that second mirror of judgment, I was shown the things that I have the greatest charges on in my life. I was shown the mirror of that which I judge in the moment rather than that which I was in the moment. And I learned the powerful lesson of discernment, of trust.
And it was a relatively inexpensive lesson compared to what came next, because immediately after that, I began dealing with uh, publishers and contracts and things like that. And through my powers of discernment, uh, I averted what could have been some, some serious, uh, serious problems in that way. So I'll invite you, look in your life at the people that you hold most dear, because that's the magnet. That's the magnet. It may be love, it may be that they're family and you don't have any choice. The people that you hold most dear, and then look at the characteristics that they exhibit that just push your buttons right and left. And ask yourself this question, are they showing me me in the moment? And if you honestly say the answer to that is no, then ask yourself the question, are they showing me that which I judge in the moment? And you may be surprised at what you find. The third scene mirror of relationship uh, is perhaps one of the most commonly recognized mirrors. Uh, this is the mirror that we sense every time we find ourselves in the presence of another individual and we look into their eyes and in that moment this magic happens, this electrical charge tingles through our body. Perhaps the hair on the back of our neck and our arms stands up in the presence of this person whom we may not even know. What has just happened in that moment? Well, through the wisdom of this mirror, we're asked to allow for the possibility that through the course of our lives, in our innocence, to survive life's offering, that we give away huge portions of ourselves uh, in the experience of life itself. That through the course of our lives, pieces of ourselves may be lost unknowingly or perhaps given away knowingly or taken from us by those who have power over us. When we find ourselves in the presence of another individual who embodies the very things that we have lost and that we are seeking to find that wholeness in ourselves, our bodies physiologically may respond to that and we'll know that as a magnetic attraction to this individual. Should you find yourself in the presence of another and for some unexplainable reason drawn to share time with this individual, ask yourself this question. What is it that I see in this person that I've lost, that I've given away, or that was taken from me? And you may be very surprised at what comes back to you as the reality occurs that within nearly every individual who you will ever encounter, you will recognize this familiarity you will sense this piece of yourself because we see it in one another throughout our lives. The third mystery of relationship. The fourth mystery, the fourth Essene mystery of relationship is a mystery of a little bit different quality. Through the course of our lives, often we will adapt patterns of behavior that become so important to us that we will rearrange the rest of our lives to accommodate this pattern of behavior. When we find ourselves in this situation, often these patterns are identified as compulsive or addictive patterns of behavior. And the fourth mystery of relationship is the mystery that allows us to see ourselves in the presence of addiction or compulsion. Through addiction and compulsion, what happens is that we find ourselves giving away, little by little, the very things that we hold most dear in life. And in the giving away, little by little, we have the opportunity to recognize and see ourselves as we lose the things that we hold most dear. So, for example, uh, when we speak of addiction and compulsion, uh, many people uh, immediately bring to mind uh, alcohol or chemicals or nicotine. And those certainly are patterns of behavior uh, that may be addictive and compulsive. And there are others that are less obvious. Uh, issues of control in a corporate or a family environment. Uh, the addictions to sex, always having to have sex, or always having to have money, or create money, um, or, or abundance in, in our lives. Those are issues of, uh, of compulsion and addiction as well. When an individual finds themselves in the presence of this pattern of behavior, what they may be assured of, and the beauty of this pattern, is that the pattern does not occur overnight. The pattern unfolds gradually over time 
little by little by little. We give away the things that we hold most dear. If we are rearranging our lives to accommodate a pattern of alcohol or chemical abuse, we may be giving away the portions of our lives, our loved ones, our families, our jobs, our very livelihood to accommodate that. And this is the beauty of this pattern, that it may be recognized at any time, at any time, rather than taking it to its extreme and losing all. We may recognize this pattern at any time, heal that pattern, and find our wholeness in that healing. Uh, 1992. I was doing a series of workshops very similar to this uh, in Mount Shasta, actually a little town just outside of Mount Shasta called McLeod. If anyone knows where McLeod is. Uh, at a wonderful place called the Stony Brook Inn. It was a bed and breakfast and at that time it was also a, a retreat center. We had rented out the entire facility. Uh, we had the whole place all to ourselves, including a great room downstairs. And in that great room there was a large screen television and we were watching our video clips at night. Well, 1992, a gentleman named Richard Hoagland had just come out with a pretty amazing piece of video of a presentation he'd given to a special session at the UN about what he believed we had found archaeologically on Mars with our Viking probes in 1976. And we were watching this as a group. And it was dark. It was in the evening. Uh, and the door opened up, and there were two travelers that came in looking for a room. Of course, the, the inn was full because we had all the rooms, and they happened to see what we were watching, and they said, this looks really interesting. Can we stay? And I said, uh, I said, sure, and they did. And when it was all over and the lights came on, uh, I looked across the room, and uh, there were two women who were traveling cross-country, and for some reason, one of them looked very familiar to me. I had never met her before. And, uh, and I just felt that sense of familiarity. Have you ever had that happen? Have you, have you ever been in a public place, uh, maybe the airport coming in here, or a bus station, or a train station, or a mall? Grocery stores are great, because no one's suspecting it, and no one's expecting it. And all of a sudden, uh, you're not looking for a relationship, you're not seeking uh, anything consciously, and all of a sudden, someone, someone may come by you and you feel them walk past you, and you think, wow, what was that? Or, or perhaps your eyes will meet. And just for, uh, just for a fraction of a second, while your eyes meet, this thing happens. This magical little thing, this electrical glimmer of recognition. And then more often than not, in our culture, that's, that's not, uh, uh, not approved. We're not supposed to do things like that. So more often than not, what will happen is we'll find a distraction. You know, if you're walking down the street, we'll, we'll do something like this. You know, we'll do one, one of these things. Or uh, look at a piece of gum on the sidewalk or, or anything to break, to break that moment. What just happened in that moment? When you look at someone and you feel that feeling, that sense of familiarity, what just happened? I worked, uh, I worked with a group of engineers at one point in my life. And one of them was a gentleman that had this happen many times each day. Many times. And typically it happened with women. And what would happen was he would, he would leave our office for a period of time. He might go out for lunch. Uh, Friday afternoon, we'd, we'd all get a paycheck. We'd go to the bank, cash our paycheck, get a bite to eat, run some errands, and, uh, and we'd come back. And he'd sit at his desk. And I'd say, what's wrong? And he'd say, I can't work. And I'd say, why not? And he says, well... I fell in love over lunch. He'd fall in love multiple times per day. And it, it wreaked havoc in his life. This is how these mirrors come up to us. That's why I'm going to share with you true life stories. Uh, it happened so often that we even had a name for it in our group. We called it getting slapped. And, and he'd go for lunch, and I'd say, how was lunch? He'd say, well, I got slapped five times. And I knew he fell in love five times. So he'd get back to work, and, and he'd sit there, and then he might do something like he'd call the bank where we cast our checks and say, who was the teller, the third one from the left, over the lunch hour? And he'd get her number, and then he'd call her. And uh, he'd say, would you like to meet for coffee after work? And she'd say, sure, sometimes. And, uh, and so they'd go meet for coffee. And while he was having coffee with this woman, he'd look at the waitress that brought them the coffee. <laughs> and he'd feel that he was in love with the waitress. And it happened again and again. It was particularly a problem for this gentleman because he had a wife, two wonderful children, <laughs> And he loved them very much. It wreaked havoc in his life. Now, this is an extreme. 
<laughs> Hopefully it's an extreme. Hopefully it's not like this in your lives. Now, I use it as an example because it, it's, it's such a vivid example. What is happening in that moment when we feel that feeling? What's going on? Well, this is what happened to me in Mount Shasta. Uh, and this happened to me every, every once in a while in my life. This has happened to me very few times. And the, the lights came on. I looked across the room. There were two women there. One of them, I looked at her in the eyes, and I had that feeling. That magical thing happened. And uh, everyone said their goodnights and went to bed. And she and I uh, were talking, and I said, would you like to go for a walk outside? And she said, sure. I don't know if you've ever been to the town of McLeod or not. A, a walk around McLeod takes about a, a minute and a half, <laughs> maybe. And we did. We did the circuit down past, uh, there's an old lumber mill, and there's a, um, a museum and a, uh, a post office and an ice cream shop. And then we were back. And I said, I enjoyed that. And she said, I did too. And I, I said, would you like to do it again? And she said, sure. So we did this several more times that evening. And, uh, and it got late, and eventually um, we said goodnight. I never got her name. We said goodnight, and, uh, and that was that, I believed. Well, it was on this same journey that a very powerful friend came into my life. I'll begin this story now, and it will have its completion before we have completed our science of compassion. Uh, it was underneath the front steps of the Stony Brook Inn that a mama kitty had given birth to uh, a litter. She'd never done this before. She didn't, apparently didn't know or wasn't capable of nursing, and all the litter died. They believed. And it was while we were there at this workshop, the mama came out carrying this little bag of fur and bones, and he was still alive somehow. And he hadn't, hadn't eaten since he'd been born. And they said, well, this is magic. Uh, that this, this animal has such a will to live we'll name him Merlin. And they did. And, and uh, Mr. Merlin was a, a beautiful, uh, all black, little male kitty. Uh, it was supposed to be an outside cat. They, there were no animals allowed inside the Stony Brook Inn. Well, the night that I got there, he found my room. Somehow he got in, found my room. He meowed. I opened the door and let him in. He never left. And he was, he was with me the entire week that I was there. And uh, he was being nursed back to health. We slept together. We dined in my room together. He'd stand on the edge of the sink while I shaved and watch me. He'd stand on the edge of the tub while I was showering, and he'd, he'd catch little water drops in his, in his whiskers that were bouncing off of my body, and we became very good friends in that short week. And as my workshop was coming to a completion, uh, it was time for me to, to come back to New Mexico. And they said, we have our quote of animals. Would you like to take Merlin with you? And, um, and I did. I said, sure. Well, that morning I was leaving, and I had to go into Mount Shasta to get the things that you need to take an animal with you when you travel cross-country. Uh, I got a leash. He was a leash-trained kitty, and little kitty water bowls and litter boxes, and all the things that you need. Well, I was driving down the street, and I stopped at a light, and I looked up, and there on the corner was the woman that I'd seen the night before. See, the story is going somewhere, <laughs> and it does tie together. It works out really well. And she was there, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she came over the window, and I said, hi, how are you doing? And she said, fine, and the light turned green, and people were honking their horns, and I said, uh, have you eaten yet? And she said, no, and I said, would you like to? She said, yes. She got in. We shopped for Merlin's things, and we went to a, a wonderful little cafe at the south end of town, and we sat and talked and talked and talked, and we were there for the rest of the morning, and the breakfast people left, and it got really quiet, and then the lunch people came in, and it got very busy, and then they left, and it got really quiet. She was driving back to the East Coast, and I was driving back to New Mexico. And uh, finally we said, well, if we're going to leave today, we, we probably should leave. And uh, she walked me in my car, and I gave her a kiss on the cheek goodbye. I, I still, to this day, I don't know what her name is. Um, and as I watched her walk away, this thing happened. And I found this tremendous sadness in my body. I, I actually began to miss her. And I watched her get in the car, and her taillights disappeared over the road to the highway. Ten years ago, if that had have happened, I would have said that I was in love. And I would have done something really romantic, like jumped in my car and flagged her down on the freeway and, and said something to her. I don't know what it would have been. And I knew that something else was happening. I knew that's not what it was. And I sat in my car, and all of a sudden, huge tears began coming down my cheeks. And I said, wow, this must be a really powerful lesson that's happening here. First, there was the familiarity. And there, there was the sense, as she was leaving, there was a sense of sadness. 
And I simply closed my eyes uh, and asked a question, as I often do. And I said, Father, I ask for the wisdom to understand what is it that I feel in my body. And when you ask a question like that, uh, whoever you believe you're asking that question to, you're expecting an answer. And, and rather than answer, uh, I got a question back. So they were making me work. And the question simply said, what is it about this woman that you miss? And I hadn't really thought about what it was. I just knew that I missed her. And I began thinking about all of the things that we had shared and all the conversation that we'd had the night before and, and all at the cafe, all through the, uh, the lunch hour. And of the many things that had happened, what I knew was that I really missed her innocence. There was uh, an innocence about her, a sense of awe and wonder. And this was big for me at this time in my life because I had gone through the academic world, the sacred journey of academia. Uh, I'd spent quite a bit of time in the corporate world. And, and there's a trade-off, and I know that you know this, that as, as we remember and as we develop the knowledge in our lives, we lose that innocence. And I, I'd become aware of that. Uh, as an example, uh, I went to school not far from here, up in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, just north of here. And if you've ever driven west on Interstate 70 out of Denver, you've seen one of the most awesome uh, spectacles that nature has to offer in the form of a road cut. And there's a road cut there where I-70 goes right through uh, the side of a mountain. And all of the layers were tilted by geologic forces about this angle. And they are the most magnificent colors you've ever seen. It goes from the deepest black to a gray and an olive, and then a, a, a violet and a pink, and then an orange and a white, and then the whole thing starts all over again. Before I was a geologist, I used to look at that and I'd say, look at those colors. How beautiful. And after I was a geologist, what I said was, look at those magnificent dip angles and the overthrust faults because I'd lost a, a degree of innocence in that respect. And what I knew in that moment, as I recognized what it was that I was missing about this woman, I knew that I was not in love with her, that she had very, very powerfully, in a brief period of time, in just a matter of hours, had held a mirror to me of a huge portion of myself that I had lost in exchange to attain that which I chose to attain in my life. And I believe that we've all done this to some degree. I believe that we have all either given away consciously, lost without even knowing it, or had taken away by those who have power over us at some point in our lives, huge portions of ourselves to survive life. And perhaps more than ever before, at this time in human and geologic history, we're asking ourselves to bring those pieces back once again so that in our wholeness, we may know ourselves and have the experiences that we're choosing to have in this lifetime. It was an amazing experience for me to have that. And I knew that she had just shown to me the third Essene mirror of relationship, that which you have lost, given away, or had taken away. And the truth is, the reality of this experience is I believe that if we are honest with one another, truly honest with one another, in almost every eye of every individual that you'll ever look into, if you look long enough, you'll see, you'll see and you'll feel that sense of a portion of yourself. You'll feel that recognition you'll sense that familiarity. I'll invite you to do this. Do this in a public place. When this happens to you, um, if it is in a, a bus or a train station or an airport or a mall or grocery stores, because people in grocery stores are usually not expecting these kinds of experiences. When someone comes into your awareness and you feel that feeling, initiate a conversation about anything. Maybe it's, maybe it's in the produce department. That happens there frequently. Talk about produce. Nice melons, nice grapes, <laughs> nice bananas, whatever it is. Anything to initiate conversation. And while they're speaking, ask yourself in your mind, ask yourself this question. What is it 
that I see in this person that I lost, that I've given away, or that I had taken away within myself. And you'll be amazed at what comes back to you. You will be amazed. This little portion of the Essene mirrors, when we do these workshops, you never know who's going to show up and how it's going to work out. And typically, we have people sign up and cancel and rearrange and postpone. Well, I did a workshop a few years ago. In the, it was in the Southwest. And when all was said and done, it was a workshop of 40 males, all men. And some of them were cowboys. I mean, these guys didn't take off their hats or their boots for anything. They said, I'll hug a man in this room. I'll never hug a man outside that door. And this little piece of information was so powerful for them because they were all married, they all loved their wives, and they were all drawn to other women all the time through their jobs, their workplace, and they didn't know why. They didn't know why. This is a powerful mirror. This applies in the corporate world, and I use this uh, as a manager in the telecommunications industry. I manage two separate and related departments. We had employees in those departments who believed they were in love with one another, which is fine. And uh, it led to a lot of lost time. Long lunches, they had more flat tires, more sick kids, and more dead grandparents than I had ever seen. And, uh, and I suspected this is what was happening. And I invited them. This is the value. This is the, why this is relative, because we can implement these principles in our lives. I invited them into a conference room. Each of them were married. They were both married, to, and they had their respective families, and they loved them very much. I invite them into a conference room with the three of us, and I, I invite them to sit and to look at one another across the table and to share with one another what it was that they were attracted to. Why were they drawn to one another? And there was almost an audible sigh of relief as they realized that they really weren't in love, that they didn't have to risk losing the families that they held dear, that they were witnessing in one another huge portions of themselves that they had lost within themselves. What a powerful mirror. 1988, I was working on the uh, Star Wars defense program uh, in Waterton Canyon, south of, of Denver. And uh, we had some high-ranking Pentagon officials that came to review our program. And each department had one invitation uh, of an individual to get to go. And, and to this day, I don't know how it landed on my desk. And it did. And I, I went to this review. And afterwards, I had the opportunity to spend time with some of these officials. And there was a conversation that was happening at, uh, um, at uh, it was a dinner, just before a dinner, that evening. And one of the people in the group looked at, at this one particular gentleman. He had risen through the ranks of uh, corporate America and was now seated on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said to him, how did you do this with your life? What is it that, you, that had to happen in your life to allow you a position of this, uh, this magnitude of power and control? And he was very conscious when he said this. He looked at everyone in the, in the circle as, as we were there. And he said, to get where I am today, each time I climbed a rung on the corporate ladder, I gave a piece of myself away. And then I'd climb another rung, and I'd give another piece away. And he said, pretty soon I'd given away everything that I've ever held dear to me, everything I've ever loved. I've given away my friends. He said, I, I essentially have no friends. I've given away my family. My wife and I are divorced. My children and I don't, don't even speak any longer. And he said, it was worth it to me because in my life, in my life, my goal was to have this power and this control. It was worth it. So he was conscious of it, and I was amazed that he was that candid, that, that he shared that. And, uh, and I know... That we, that we do this, that we compromise pieces of ourselves to survive whatever it is that life offers to us. So when you find yourself powerfully, magnetically drawn to another person, maybe it doesn't make sense why that would be. Maybe it's a person of the same sex, and you try to put a label on that. And I've worked with a lot of clients in the last few years who have had those experiences. Or maybe you say, I'm a woman, and I just like to be around men. What does that mean? Or I'm a man, I just, I just like to be around women. Think about, think about this experience. Think how odd this experience is that we're having right now. We are essentially genderless souls. We're not male or female until we come into bodies. And then we come to this world of polarity, and we must choose one or the other. 
And when you choose one or the other, you compromise that which you did not choose. So as a male, I came to this world, I chose to polarize into a male body, although my, my soul is genderless. It is both masculine and feminine simultaneously. So I put my feminine on the back burner. And women, you've put your masculine on the back burner. So when we arrive in this world, we may find ourselves unexplainably drawn to someone of the other polarity. I did a workshop in the, in the Bay Area a few, uh, a few months ago, and people said, what about when we're drawn to the same polarity? What does that mean? And I believe that the mirror holds. And this is a powerful mirror with no labels. It's simply a mirror. Let me give you an example of how this may work. This is a case history that I worked with. What happens if you're a male? You come into this world, you're, you're a genderless spirit, you choose to become a male, you compromise your feminine. So you've given 50% of that experience away already, and you come here as, as a male. Early in life as a male, what if you live conditions where your masculinity is taken from you through abuse, in this particular example, in this case history, through abuse? You gave your feminine away to be here, and once you got here, your masculine was taken from you, what have you got left? Nothing. What will you seek? You will seek to reinforce that which you most identify with at that point in your life. If you've come into this world of, as a male and that masculinity was taken from you, you'll seek to reinforce that which you have that recent memory of. You may seek time, and this gentleman was seeking time with a male. And it was confusing to him. He didn't know why. And as he began to understand this, it made tremendous sense to him why. And within a few months, he didn't have that orientation any longer. And if he had of, that would have been fine as well. Because we're simply dealing with patterns of energy until we place labels on them. Isn't it interesting how that works? We'll seek to reinforce that which we have lost, given away, or had taken away in our lives. So I'll invite you to look at your life, look at the people that you are compelled to be with, and ask yourself, what is it in them that you've lost, given away, or had taken away in your life? And then romance in our culture today, romantic relationships. How many times have you heard of couples that come together because they feel this charge, and the charge goes away? And they say, well, I'm not in love anymore. And the reality may very well be that their love has served them so well, that which they sought in another, they have now healed in themselves. And they will not feel that charge. And at that point, they have served one another so well, they become, they've become that wholeness. From that point forward, they may choose to continue that relationship based on uh, completely different principles because they simply enjoy one another's company. The fifth pattern of, uh, of relationship, the fifth Essene mirror of relationship, for me it perhaps is, is the single most powerful pattern. It, I believe, uh, allows us to see more and to a greater level why we've lived the kinds of lives that we've lived perhaps than any other. It is the mirror that our parents show to us through the course of our lives and the time that we spend with them. Through this mirror, we're asked to allow for the possibility, to entertain the possibility, that perhaps, just perhaps, the actions of our parents toward us are mirroring our beliefs and our expectations of what may be the most sacred relationship we'll ever know in our lifetimes. And that is a relationship between us and our heavenly mother and father, or the male uh, masculine, female, feminine aspect of our Creator, however that's viewed. It is through this relationship, as we witness our parents, that our parents are showing us ourselves in that expectation and in those beliefs of that divine relationship. So, for example, if we find ourselves in a relationship with parents where we feel we're judged constantly, or that we feel that our best is never good enough, there is a high probability that in that relationship, the truth of what's being mirrored is our belief within ourselves 
that we may not be good enough or that we may not have accomplished that which has been expected of us through our perceptions of ourselves and our Creator. This is a powerful, it's a very subtle mirror, uh, and it's a mirror that perhaps will tell us more about why we've lived our lives as we have than any other. I invited you to, to share with yourself, and then I ask you to, to share some with, with us, characteristics of your primary childhood caretakers. I define childhood up to and including the age of puberty, uh, both positive and negative, and I ask you to do these on the first line of B and on the first line of A. And there's another line below that was, uh, should have been left blank, and if it's not, you can write on something else. What I'll ask you to do now is to identify on this piece of paper in single words or short phrases, single words work best, short phrases, to identify both positive and negative characteristics of your primary caretakers the way that you see them now. With all the work and all the healing and all of the things that have happened in your life, the way that you see them now. If your caretakers are no longer with you, the way that you last saw them, or the way that you see them now when you think about them, if you've had the opportunity to go through and redefine what these relationships have meant to you. Both positive and negative, and we'll use both of these. And I'll give you a few moments to do this. Take your time. Write a few, uh, a few words down. Let's take a look at, at what we've got. Um, to the degree that you're comfortable in, in sharing a few of these, what were some of the positive characteristics of either or both male and female caretakers uh, as you see them now? What are some of those characteristics? Vulnerable. Vulnerable? Okay. More loving? Strength. Inventive. Mm -hmm. Hmm. They like creative. Beautiful. Oh, I like that one. Actually, today's my mom's birthday. And I just said that to her this morning. I called her um, before I, I came in, and I said, do you feel any different? And she says, no. And I said, well, there's no reason why you should. She's a, she is about to embark on a new journey in her life, a trip to New Mexico and maybe a new man. <laughs> Youthful. Sure, as many as. OK. All right, good. What was the last one? Needing. Needing. How, how is that? You see that as a positive? I see that as positive because before they were kind of closed, not thinking that they needed the love and the attention from their children. So maybe, maybe more open. Yeah. Openness? Yeah. I'll put it right down here. Okay. What are some of the negatives? If there are any. What are some of the negatives? Judgmental. Judgmental. You're not working me hard enough. Rigid. What was it? Pardon me? Rigid. Rigid. Ah. So that didn't change from yesterday, did it? That was the way you saw them as a child, and that's the way you see them as, as an adult. It's funny how sometimes it was just like an adjective, like more or less, mm -hmm. in front of conditions that were yeah. still. It, it is. It's real interesting. There's, uh, there are many things that we can do with this. We're going to, to focus in on one specific aspect. This, there's a tremendous amount of information in here. Prejudice. Okay. 
Misunderstood. Misunderstood? Okay, that's, that's good. We have a sampling here. <clears throat> the mirror that I'm about to share with you, for me, uh, has, uh, has had a, a tremendously powerful impact on my life. And, uh, and the impact has had many implications. So I'm going to share this with you with a sentence. And then we're going to take that sentence and look at it from many, many different perspectives. We'll be discussing this mirror for a little while uh, because the sentence is a mouthful. So the first thing I'll say before I, I do this is I'll say that there, there are uh, few absolutes. There are always exceptions. And we're looking for patterns and generalities. So what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to ask you to look for patterns and generalities. As I share these things with you, if you feel something welling up inside of you that says, no way, there's a good chance you've just found a really powerful piece of information about your life and your history, and now you're being asked to choose whether or not this is the time to view it. If the answer is yes, you'll have the tools. If the answer is no, you've heard the tools. So if, as I'm sharing this with you, you feel this emotion, your body temperature heat up a little bit, your heartbeat might rise a little bit, uh, your fingers may tingle, kind of like being in love. Um, this may be what's happening and, and the only way that you will have a response is when you are, uh, you're being shown something that, uh, that is so deep that uh, you may have chosen to avert looking at it in the past. So what I'll say to you is this about this mirror, regardless of what you've placed here, and, and there's no judgment, good or bad, right or wrong, we're looking at the overall mirror in the world of polarity where we see pluses and minuses. There is a good possibility that the words that you've used to describe your parents now as an adult have very little to do with the people on this earth that you call mom and dad there is a good possibility that the words that you've used to describe your parents on this earth, in those words, you're describing a mirror. And this is the mirror that your parents have held to you impeccably, providing you insight into the most sacred relationship you will ever know as you walk this world there's a good possibility that the way you've seen your mother and father of this world represents a mirror of your expectations, the relationship you have with your heavenly mother and father. Okay, let me say this again. There is a good possibility that the way you've seen your parents, the way you describe them, the words that you use, that those are the words describing your expectations of your relationship with your heavenly mother and your heavenly father. Now, there are many different ways to look at this, and we're going to go into this in a lot of detail, and we'll go through a little exercise. Is it possible? Is it possible that in inviting you, whether it was conscious or unconsciously, when your parents brought you into this world, you were invited to come to this world. Is it possible that with that invitation lives an unspoken responsibility that we've forgotten in our culture that says those that will bring us or care for us in this world, the mother and father in this world are surrogates. They're the closest thing that we know to mother and father in our heavenly creator. We know that our creator in, in, um, in reality is genderless. There, there, there is no mother or father. There's a, a force, if, if you will. And we're using our English language to approximate, to approximate this. Is it possible that your mother and father have loved you so much, perhaps on levels they were or still are not even aware of, 
that they have impeccably held to you a mirror showing you the way you see your relationship not with your earthly father with your heavenly father not with your earthly mother with your heavenly mother is it possible that when you have perceived that your parents were angry at you that what was really happening is you were feeling your creators perceived creators anger at you is it possible that when your parents are proud of you and when they encourage you that and it feels so good that you're actually feeling that from your creator is that possible if the mirrors work and if they hold I believe this is precisely precisely what's happening I believe there's a good possibility that we love on levels unspoken and so deeply that we will impeccably hold these mirrors to one another and our parents have done precisely this for us so I'm not saying that this is an excuse or a condoning for any patterns of behavior that our parents have ever demonstrated and we'll we'll go into this whole this whole thing I'm simply asking you to allow for the possibility that the relationship that you've had with those who have cared for you your parents maybe maybe they were you were adopted maybe you were in foster homes whoever it was that assumed that responsibility for you they have held the mirror allowing you to see we don't get up in the morning and say I wonder how my relationship with my heavenly creator is, is going today typically we don't do that we're focused in living and breathing and surviving and providing for one another in this world and it's in this world where we see the mirrors exemplified so I'm asking you to allow for the possibility that those who have consented to care for you in this world possibly on an unspoken level in that caring that they've held this mirror and this mirror has shown you your beliefs and your expectations of how you believe your creator sees you and how you see your creator how do you feel about the possibility that your parents have held this mirror for you does it make any sense first of all let's try something let's try something I invite you to close your eyes close your eyes take a deep breath deep yogic breath yogic breath is where you push your tummy out when the inhale that means your diaphragm just dropped okay and then pause briefly don't be in such a big hurry to get rid of that breath and when you do exhale tighten your tummy muscles a little bit just take a deep yogic breath okay now in your mind I'll invite you to say to yourself to consent consent to feeling in your mind in your mind say I consent to feel I allow myself to feel in your mind I invite you to say to yourself to consent to remembering say I, I remember I consent to my remembering and now I'll ask you a question if someone came to you on this day and said to you that you had one minute left in this world and after that minute that you would no longer be present in this world or communicate with those that you love and hold most dear and in that one minute you could say anything that you would choose to say to your earthly mother and father what would you choose to say to them in that minute what would you choose I invite you to share those words with me. What words would you choose in that one minute? Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me? 
We are one. Be happy. Be happy. See you soon. See you soon. I love you. Certainly, I love you. All right. If someone came to you and said to you that you had one minute left in this world with those that you love and hold most dear, and in that one minute, in that one minute, you could hear from your mother and father anything, what would you most choose to hear from your mother and father? What would you most choose to hear from your mother and father? I invite you to share those with me. What would you most choose to hear? I love you just the way you are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Okay, with your eyes closed, take a deep breath. And I invite you to listen. If in that one minute you were able to hear anything, I'll do gentlemen first. Gentlemen, if you had one moment in this world and you could hear anything from your Creator, you heard your Creator say, My son, I'm proud of you. My son, I love you. You've done well. Thank you, my son. Your ladies, if you could hear my daughter, thank you. You have done well. My daughter, come home. How do you feel when you hear those words? Can you feel that feeling in your body? Why? They're just words. Is it possible that we have spent much of our lives believing that we were seeking the love and the respect and approval from our earthly parents because they're the closest thing that we know to our mother and father in heaven. And the reality is that we have always felt at a deep, deep level that's our mother and father, creator, that we're seeking to hear the approvals from. Is that possible? If that's so, then that has just told you a tremendous amount of information about why you've lived your life the way you've lived it and how you've lived your life. And how you've lived your life. I did a workshop in Mount Shasta a few months ago, and we did this, pro this program, and we came to this part of the process. And there were about 230 people in the room, and there was a gentleman who raised his hand and he said, this is ridiculous. This does not work for me at all. So right there I knew that something was going to happen. And I invited him and I, I said, are you comfortable sharing this with 229 other people in the room? And he said, sure. He said, this mirror doesn't work for me at all. Just no way. And I said, tell me about your father. And he says, I don't know anything about my father. I never knew my father. He left uh, before I was born. I don't know who my father is. And I said, tell me how you view your heavenly father. And he says, there is no God. I don't believe in God. And I said, the mirror stands. The mirror stands. By having no father in your life, the man that deserted you mirrored, even at that young age, your belief and your expectation that there is no Father in Heaven, and now your life path has been spent seeking to prove or disprove that. You have now have had to come to terms within yourself as to whether or not there is a Father in Heaven. And by your Father leaving you early in life, 
he pushed you to the edge of who you believed you were and asked you to redefine that. And he said, oh, my God. It's the first time he had seen it that way. My mother and I have had this discussion a lot. Her father lived to be between 94 and 96. We're not certain because he lied about his age during the Depression, and then he forgot later in life. <laughs> so we're not sure precisely how old he was. He just passed away in January. Um, my mother was divorced in, uh, in 66, and she spent pretty much each day of her life making uh, a couple of trips to see her father uh, when he was living at home, in his home. At the age of 80, he developed a condition as a male that typically affects women in their 30s. It's called myasthenia gravis. It's a condition where his body produced a chemical that would intercept the signals between his brain and his muscle. So he'd think the thought, and his muscle would never get the thought. And he, uh, he required round-the-clock care and many different kinds of medications for that. And the doctors said to us at that time, we doubt that, for my mother, she, he said, we doubt your father will live much longer. Well, uh, he lived until he was 94, if that condition. And they never understood why. They never really understood what kept him going all that time. Well, my grandfather just passed away in January, and uh, Mom and I had this conversation. She said, why was my daddy here so long? It hurt him to be here. He wasn't happy in life. And I said, are you willing to look at this mirror? And I'll use this as an example. She was an only child, and all through her life, my mom has said things to me like, how can God let this happen? Or why would God allow this kind of thing? And she's questioned and pondered. Uh, the existence of a, of a creator. If the mirror holds, I believe what was being shown in that relationship was that her father, on an unspoken, perhaps an unconscious level, said to her, my daughter, I will always be there for you. I will always be there for you. And he stayed until his body would not support that any longer, proving to my mother her father, earthly father, or father in heaven, was always there for her. And she, and she now knows that. She got that. And that's where the healing begins. We have the opportunity. We have the opportunity. Through our earthly relationships, you may heal that relationship with your earthly surrogates, and in doing so, you have healed that relationship with their heavenly counterparts. And it works the other way around. As you heal that relationship with the heavenly counterparts, it has to have healed with your earthly surrogates. So it's not saying that you're responsible for the illnesses of your parents or that you're responsible for any choices they've made in their lives. They simply agreed on some level to hold a mirror to you, reflecting your expectations, and they chose how to carry that mirror around. As they are released from the burden of that mirror. Now the question becomes, do they remember their truest nature? Is there a part of their consciousness? Does their body go, ah, at last, this kid finally got it, and now I can live my life? Is there a part of them that does that? Or do they become so entrenched in their belief systems that they believe they are those illnesses? And that's where we all work together to, to heal and to remember those possibilities. Does that make any sense? This is a subtle mirror. Remember I said yesterday and earlier in the session, they become more subtle as we go through and that we must come to terms with the least subtle ones before we'll ever see the ones of greater subtlety. Because it is a mirror, the beauty is it works both ways. And this is important. We're not always looking at negatives. When we see our parents as loving and wise and, and showing their vulnerability and strong and honest and tolerant, that's our parents mirroring back to us our beliefs of our relationship with our Creator. We're seeing our Creator, ourselves in the presence of that creative force in, in this way. So I'm offering this as a possibility. It's subtle. It's powerful. It has rippling implications throughout your life. And I'll invite you, if it makes sense now, you have it. If it does not, file it away. And should there come a time in your life when your current belief system falls away, and you can go to the little file folder of this one, and you have a powerful tool. 
okay? That's the mirror of Mother, Father, Creator. The sixth scene mirror of relationship uh, is a mirror that has a rather ominous name. The ancients call it the dark night of the soul. And, and clearly, the mirror does not have to be as ominous as its namesake. Through the dark night of the soul, uh, we are reminded that life has a propensity toward balance. Nature has a propensity toward balance. And that it takes uh, an extremely skillful, masterful being to upset the balance in nature and to upset the balance in our lives. When we find ourselves in the greatest challenges of life, it is in those moments that we may be assured the only way, the only way those challenges are possible is after we have amassed each tool that will allow us to move through that challenge with grace and with ease. That's the only way it can happen. Until those tools are amassed, we will never see ourselves in the situations that ask us to demonstrate these high levels of mastery. So from this perspective, the greatest challenges of life, those of relationship, perhaps our very survival, may be viewed as tremendous opportunities to demonstrate mastery rather than tests that may be passed or failed in life. And it's through this mirror of the dark night of the soul that we see ourselves naked, perhaps for the first time, without the emotion and the feeling and the thought of all of the constructs that we've created around us that we believe keep us safe in life. And it is through this dark night of the soul, perhaps for the first time, we have the opportunity to see ourselves in that way and to prove to ourselves, to demonstrate to ourselves that the process of life may be trusted and that we may trust ourselves in life. The dark night of the soul is, um, is an opportunity for us to lose everything that we've ever held dear in our lives and to see ourselves in the presence, in the nakedness of that nothing. And as we climb out of the abyss that is left from everything that we've lost and we see ourselves in a new way, that is where we find our highest levels of mastery. The ancients talk about the dark night of the soul very clearly. I had a, a client that came to me when I was working in the Bay Area. He was a software engineer, uh, a brilliant software engineer, a young gentleman. He was married, had a wife and two children, two daughters. And he loved them all very much. And in his software environment, his skills were in such demand that pretty soon he began traveling tremendously. Uh, first, he was going to technical sites, and he began doing trade shows, uh, tech-supported trade shows. He saw less and less of his family, and the few times he did see his family, he felt like he didn't know them. There was little to talk about on the weekends. He didn't know what his kids were doing in school. His wife and he, uh, their communication was, was uh, lacking. Um, into his department, the company moved another engineer. And it was a woman from Los Angeles, same age. They began sending them as a team to these different programs. And it wasn't, you see where this is going, it wasn't long before he believed that he was in love with this woman. And she believed that she was in love with him. Uh, she applied for a transfer back to her home office in Los Angeles. He did the same thing from San Francisco and was given a job in L.A. His, uh, his department was very upset with him. His friends thought he was just out of his mind. Uh, his family was devastated, and he said, well, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I've hurt these people, and that's okay, I'm, I'm off to my new life. So he went to, to Los Angeles, and they were down there about three weeks, and the woman came home one day and said, you know, this is the relationship I thought it was going to be. I'd like to end it. He was devastated. What universal fear did, did he just get lit up? He was devastated when she, when she asked him to leave. He began performing poorly at work. And he was put on probation, and he, he didn't, didn't get any better. The company asked him to leave. And he found himself in a, a strange city, no friends, no support system, no income, no job. And he was blacklisted from other, um, other departments in a similar industry. And he had nowhere to return to because all the things he had held most dear, he had given away. 
His uh, department didn't want him back. His family wasn't there for him, his friends. And he came to me in the Bay Area and said, what in the world has happened in my life? How do I get my family back? And I said to him, in all sincerity, congratulations, because the only way something like this can happen in your life is when you've attained the highest levels of mastery. And in that mastery, when the last piece of the mastery is put in place, that's the opening in creation that says, now this gentleman is ready to demonstrate this level of mastery over whatever it is that he created in his life. When life looks the worst, when we're faced with the greatest challenges of health or relationship or survival, what I know is the only way, it is only possible, we are only possible of creating those situations for ourselves after we have amassed all the tools required to gracefully see us through that experience. And, and your mom knew this, and she always told you. She said, your mo she said God never gives you more than you, can, than you can handle. Did your mom ever tell you that? God never puts more on your plate than you can handle. And I've seen this happen time and time and time again. Issues of health, life-threatening illnesses, uh, emotional uh, uh, implosions, for lack of a, a better word. And what I know is this, that there is a propensity for balance in our lives. We have a tendency toward balance. And we have to work very, very hard to upset balance. And as masters, we all know ways to do that. As masters, we have developed ways to create tremendous imbalances in our lives. And in the imbalance, that's the impetus for us to demonstrate the level of mastery that we have attained. We're offered an opportunity for which we have no point of reference. No one to ask, no one to go to. We've never had the experience before. And in that no point of reference, all we have is ourselves. And that's where we're asked to reach down into the deepest levels of our being. From the ancient perspectives, then, we're allowed, uh, are asked to allow for the possibility that the forces at play in our polarized world are forces that have chosen to come to this world to anchor the polarized realities. That the light and the dark are in service to us so that we may know ourselves in all ways. And the only way to anchor the light in the dark in this world is for a force or a field or a consciousness to hold those mirrors for us. As we view pre-12th century texts, I believe that the scenario unfolds very clearly. Uh, as we're offered a story through, uh, through the metaphors of individuals, the individual of Archangel Mikael anchoring light, the metaphor of Archangel Lucifer anchoring dark. Uh, in uh, pre-12th century texts, these metaphors are viewed as benevolent, loving beings that have chosen to descend into our world in service to us, holding benign mirrors of experience so that we may find ourselves anywhere between those mirrors, knowing ourselves in the presence of the lightest and the light and the darkest of the dark. I was dealing with uh, the concept, uh, a concept that had been with me for a long time and had never made much sense to me, the role of good and evil or light and dark in our lives and, and what, it, what it means to us, what it may offer to us, how it plays out in our lives. My conditioning, I grew up in the Midwest, a uh, pretty conservative community. My conditioning had been that there were two forces at work in this world. There's a force that we call the light that likes us, that likes me, is there to support me, and all the good things in life that happen are of that light. And that there was another force that didn't like me and that I could move through my life making the choices to bring me the things that I would most choose to have. And if I slipped up maybe one time that this force that didn't like me had the ability to snuff out everything that I'd ever known to be true. And I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like the feeling that there was a, a power over me in, in that respect. So 
I suspected somehow that my relationship to my ideas of light and dark somehow were playing out in all these other things that were happening. If the mirrors hold true, this is another mirror. If the mirrors hold true. And uh, feeling a little overwhelmed at that time in my life, I went to my advisors at school and I went to my employers, my three employers, and I explained to each of them I needed some time off. And none of them really seemed to sympathize with me. So I left my jobs, uh, I left school. <clears throat> packed everything I had in a little uh, pickup truck and headed up one of the most, uh, I believe, one of the, probably the best kept secret in northern Colorado, so it won't be secret anymore. It's uh, a canyon called Poudre Canyon, just west of uh, Fort Collins. Oh, what a magnificent little canyon it is. And I drove uh, about 90 miles west to a little town called Walden. Just outside of Walden, Colorado, there's a place called Lost Lake, which of course is not lost because everyone knows where Lost Lake is. And, uh, and I went to Lost Lake to come to terms with all these things that were happening in my life at that time. And uh, it, was, it was one of those times in life where maybe the goals and the expectations are a little greater than the reality of what's going to happen. I said, well, I'll set up camp here on the edge of this lake. I'll live off the land. If you ever choose to live off the land, take backups. It's always a good idea. <laughs> take something. Uh, and I did not. And I did. I, I set up a little camp uh, on a beautiful pine forest floor on, right on the banks of, uh, uh, of Lost Lake. It's right around 10,000 feet. It was beautiful. It, it still is. It's just a beautiful place to be. And during the day, I'd just kind of putter around. I'd do my prayers and my meditations. And um, at night, I'd start a fire and cook dinner. And I'd, I'd do my prayers and meditations. And not much happened for the first two days. Nothing happened for the first two days. I'll just tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> And on the third, the third evening, uh, I did something different. And it's something I'd never done before then, and I now know that there's actually a name for it in the indigenous traditions in, in North America. It's called the Dream Fire Ceremony. Uh, and what I did differently was that after dinner, uh, in the fire that was in front of me, instead of closing my eyes and doing my prayers and my meditations, I left them wide open. And I gazed into this flame until I found a very comfortable place. And there's a little place right at the top of the flame, and there's a little space, and then the rest of the flame is there. And I know that you know where it is. You've seen it in candles. You've seen it in matches. There's a magical place. That is a magical place. Uh, it allows us to relax and move into an altered state of awareness, sometimes without even knowing it. And that was what was happening to me uh, that evening as I began this dream fire ceremony. And I, I didn't know at that time that it even had a name. And with my eyes wide open, I asked a question that I had asked many, many times before in my life. And I said, Father, I ask for the wisdom to know of the role of light and dark in my life, in my relationship with them at this time in my life. And when I ask questions like that, generally I expect answers. And, uh, and there was no answer. Rather, there was a question that came back to me from a, a voice that, uh, by that time, my life was very familiar to me. In 1959, I'd had two near-death experiences the same month, in July 1959. In each of those near-death experiences, I came to know a voice that has been with me from that time forward, and that voice is what I was hearing uh, in this dream fire ceremony. And the voice asked me a question rather than give me an answer. It simply said, how may you know the forces of light and dark and the role that they play in your life until you actually know what the forces of light and dark are. And I thought about that. And it made sense because all I really knew is my conditioning, what other people had told me, what I'd seen in books, and what limited experience I'd had up until that time in my life. My experience didn't match my conditioning. And that was where the confusion came from. So with my eyes wide open, I asked. I asked to know what the power of darkness in our world is, is really all about from a first-hand perspective. And almost immediately, in my mind's eye, images began to race through of all of, the, all of the hideous characters that I had seen in textbooks, in, in uh, my family Bible, uh, loose, saggy flesh individuals, um, very discolored bodies, usually bloodshot eyes, 
And I began to see these things in my mind. And when you're in a campfire around 10,000 feet late at night by yourself, you can conjure up some pretty, some pretty uh, amazing images. And I did that. But what happened next was completely unexpected. Because as I was envisioning those things in my mind, an image began to coalesce in that magical place in the flames in front of me. And it frightened me. And I, I thought about getting up and leaving, and I did not. I looked down and blinked my eyes, and when I looked back up, it was still there. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a reality. What I'm saying is that this is my experience that led me to an understanding. I'm going to share this with you. I watched this image as it coalesced, and it, it uh, became denser and denser and denser until I could see that it was the head and part of the chest of a being that I had seen in my mind's eye, hovering in the flames in front of me, and it was looking away from me, fortunately, which gave me an opportunity to study what this phenomenon was that was happening, this thing that was in front of me. And I did. And, and rather than feeling fear, my fear moved into fascination. And I simply began to look, and I was fascinated at at the folds and the creases and the saggy flesh and, and the scaliness uh, uh, at the same time that was shimmering in this fire. And while I was experiencing that fascination, the image began to rotate and the face began to turn toward me until it was facing me full on. And at that time, I had the opportunity to look eye to eye into the flames, into this thing that I had conjured up. To me, that was the epitome of all darkness or all evil as I'd been conditioned to believe it in my life. And I simply stared. I know now the entire experience lasted uh, about 22 minutes. And uh, when you're having an experience like that, it seems like an eternity. As I stared, something began to happen. And the image of the epitome of evil, what to me was the epitome of evil in the flames, began to change and it got softer and softer and softer. And in just a few short moments, replacing the hideous image that had been there earlier was the face of a very young child. Neither male nor female, it was simply a child that was in the flames. And the child looked at me and as I looked at this child, I felt this tremendous sense of sadness well up from within me. And the child had huge tears coming down its cheeks, and I found myself with tears coming down my cheeks at the same time. With that experience, I began to re-examine my conditioning, and that led me on a path through many ancient, obscure, and esoteric texts. And what I'll share with you now is what I believe is perhaps the greatest potential of our healing, of any illusion of separation between us and our world and our Creator, and the source of all that we will ever know as fear. And think about that. I ask you this morning to describe to me the negative characteristics of your primary caretakers. And we had many different words, many different perspectives that, under, uh, that, that had the underlying uh, aspect of fear. And I said, of all of these different expressions, they all pretty much resolve to one or some combination of those three universal fears. And now these scenes offer us a path and take it one step further. They say, as you heal, not if, as you heal this memory, then you have healed those universal fears. So in simply healing a single memory, fear is no longer possible in your life. In simply healing a single memory. Well, let's take a look at that memory. When we talk about light and dark in our world, we have, uh, historically, we have images that come to mind when we think of light and dark. If darkness and light 
are equal and different only in seeming, as we're told in the ancient texts. And they are benign forces in service to us rather than forces that either like or do not like us. That's a very different world that we're living in. Very different. It is only possible for you to feel judgment and rigidity and anger and selfishness and abuse, control issues, or to have those experiences within yourself if you still have allowed for fear in your life. The only way that fear is possible is if you believe that dark and light are separate from one another and that the darkness is something other than our Creator. If you allow for the possibility that darkness is part of our Creator, just as light, however you view your Creator, it makes no, no difference. If you allow for that possibility that there's a single source of all that we'll ever know in our world and it has many different forms of expression, it is impossible to fear. Your body mirrors your belief in the relationship between light and dark. Your body mirrors your belief. Illness is only possible if you believe that those forces are separate. Death is only possible if you believe those forces are separate. And as you allow for the possibility of the marriage of those two forces in service to you, your body mirrors that biologically. You mirror that through your immune system. You mirror that through the way your cells rebuild themselves. You mirror that in your relationships with one another, and life becomes very, very different. Because it is no longer possible to fear or to hate if all there is is love in our world. What I believe has happened is that here we are in this, this paradigm. We have had such a tremendous acceleration of technology out here. We now witness the moment of conception live in a human womb. Not a still photograph. We witness it live. We have witnessed DNA passing between a sperm and an egg. We have peered into the depths of the quantum world of the atom, and we've sent these extensions of our perceptions deep into interstellar space beyond the boundaries of our solar system, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we're still trying to reconcile what happens in our world in terms of forces in dark and light good and bad, devils and angels. I believe that path has served us very well. I bless that path. And I believe that very rapidly you've outgrown that path. And now, because that path has served you so well, it's brought you to the point. All of us, we're all in this together. It's brought us to this point where we may redefine now what the events of our life mean. When we witness, you turn on the 6 o'clock news and you see something that has hurt you, what do you do with that? How do you reconcile that? You say, if all that's here is love, and I'm witnessing 10,000 Rwandans massacred laying dead on the side of the road by their own people, how do I reconcile that? What does that mean? Or typically what you'll hear is, how can God let that happen? Well, if we allow for the possibility that there's a single source of all that is in this world, then you have just opened the door and paved the path. You're allowing for a much greater possibility that the ancients called the science of compassion. Until we can reconcile those two forces, compassion may not make a lot of sense. The seventh mystery of relationship, the seventh is seen mirror from the perspective of the ancients, was the most subtle and for some the most difficult. This is the mirror that asks us to allow for the possibility that each experience of life, regardless of its outcome, is perfect in its nature. Regardless of whether or not we achieve the lofty goals that have been set by others, we're asked, we're invited to view our accomplishments in life without comparing them to anything else, without any external reference. The only way that we may view ourselves in failure or success is when we measure our accomplishments to an external yardstick. And the question then arises, what is it that we hold ourselves accountable to? 
what is it that we use as our yardstick of accomplishment? From the perspective of this mirror, we're asked to allow for the possibility that all aspects of our lives, each aspect of our personal life, whether it's our body shape or our body weight or our academic or business or athletic achievements, are perfect as they stand. And we will see that they are, in fact, that way and can only be judged when they are compared to an external reference. We're invited to allow for ourselves to be that reference. The last mirror the ancients considered the most subtle mirror. And to share with you this mirror, I'm going to share it in, in a couple different ways, a couple different stories. One of my last years in the corporate environment, I shared an office with a woman uh, because our office space was limited. So we had very different functions and simply shared space together. And because there was no competition, we became very good friends. We just simply spoke with one another, went to lunch together a lot. One day we came back from lunch and she picked up her voicemail and as she was listening to her messages I saw her face turn sheet white and she sat down and I said, what happened? And she shared with me a story and I'm going to share that story with you now to illustrate uh, this mirror. She had just uh, had a friend that was her age that had a, a young daughter. This daughter had uh, graduated from high school just a couple of years earlier. A beautiful young woman was extremely gifted in many areas. Uh, she was very athletic. She excelled at academics. She was a wonderful artist, and she chose to become a model when she graduated from high school, and her parents supported her in that choice. Uh, she had uh, done some modeling and done very well. She had gone to um, uh, it was a modeling school in New York City and had just completed a series of jobs, and it appeared that uh, two years out of high school, she was on her way to a pretty successful modeling career. Well, after the first couple of jobs, the modeling agencies began to say, for this kind of work, you're, you'll have to change your appearance a little bit. And they started with some obvious things. And they, uh, even at her young age, they, um, they did some tucks around her, her midline. Um, they enlarged her breasts, relatively common kinds of, of plastic surgery. Her parents supported her in that, and they said, well, that's what this industry takes. It's, that's what it takes. Well, it wasn't long before the modeling agencies began asking for more extreme forms of, of modification. Uh, and for example, she had uh, a really cute little overbite when she'd smile. And they said, well, you can't have an overbite and be a model. So uh, they asked her, and she did, when, uh, underwent a, a procedure where her jaws were broken and reset, wired shut, and the idea was that, that the overbite would be gone. And to be honest, uh, I saw before and after pictures, I, I could see very little difference. I really could see very little difference. And I thought the overbite was kind of nice. Well, while her jaws had been wired, uh, of course, her, uh, she was on limited diet. She lost quite a bit of weight, and, uh, which is generally desirable in the, in the modeling industry. And as she lost that weight, uh, some of these ribs, the lower ribs, floating ribs, uh, began to stick out more than they had before. And the modeling people said, well, that's no problem. We can address that surgically. And they did. They went in and took out these two floating ribs on either side. And, and something began to happen with her. And uh, maybe you've seen this before. Uh, body weight kind of goes in, um, in modes. I, I was a competitive runner for almost 20 years. And there were some times I could eat anything, no matter what it was, and, uh, and I, I just couldn't keep weight on my body. And there were other times I could think about eating and not do it, and I would, I would gain weight. And your body kind of goes into a mode. If you can stop eating for a while, and you'll still maintain a constant weight or maybe even gain weight. And, um, uh, and you can begin to lose weight, and then you say, okay, well, that's enough. I'll start eating again, and your body is still in a lose weight mode, and it keeps going. And that's what happened to this woman. She uh, began to lose weight and uh, was in a, a lose weight mode. And the phone call that my friend had that morning was from this, uh, the young girl's mother. Uh, her daughter had just died in the hospital from complications of malnutrition in the hospital because her body could not assimilate that weight. And my question was, why did this happen? Why? What was it all about? A few months ago, Melissa and I were traveling. Uh, we live in where well, we have to fly out of Albuquerque to get to anywhere. 
And on certain airlines, I won't mention airline names, but certain airlines, you have to go through Dallas before you go anywhere else. <laughs> so when I went to Toronto, I had to go from Albuquerque to Dallas to get to Toronto or to Kansas City to go to Dallas. Well, if you've been to DFW, you know uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. It's a huge airport, and there's a tram system that takes you from um, concourse to concourse, in theory, when, when it's up and working. And when it isn't working, it's a wonderful system. It really works well. Typically what happens is we come in on the end of gate 6 and we go out on gate 44 and there's a good half mile, I know, or, or more between the two. And uh, on this particular day, we were at the bottom uh, of, a, of a large escalator waiting for the, the trains to come by. And, uh, and there was a couple that was standing next to me. There's about a three minute wait between trains. There was a couple standing next to me. An elderly couple, and apparently the gentleman was hard of hearing. And this couple had an ongoing dialogue, a constant dialogue, where they were, between themselves, where they were evaluating everyone around them. And uh, apparently, it's something they had just always done. Uh, it seemed very comfortable for them. And, and as people would come in, they'd say, oh, look at, uh, who dressed that man this morning, you know? Or, look at, look at her, why does you know, why, why she do that? Oh, look at that earring. Well, I was standing here, they were standing here, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw an extremely large woman coming down the escalator. I, I had a client at one time that weighed about 450, and I know that this woman was real close to 400 pounds. She was coming down the escalator, and she was holding an old-fashioned suitcase, old linoleum with brass fittings on the side, hard, hard shell. It was 115 in Dallas that day. And I knew that for whatever reason she was traveling, she must have had a good reason, because travel could not have been easy for her. Uh, the heat, the accommodations of the seats, uh, her legs were swollen, her ankles, and she was carrying this funny little suitcase. And she came up and stood right next to us. And this couple continued to do what they'd been doing. And because the gentleman was hard of hearing, as he was sharing with his wife, we all heard. As he said to his wife, look at that woman. Isn't that terrible? Why doesn't she do something with herself? She should be ashamed of herself for coming in public like that. Now, this is one of those rare opportunities. I was here, the couple was here, and the heavy woman was here. And I believe, on an unspoken level, she consented to me looking at her eyes because she looked right at me. So I looked into her eyes, and she never said a word, and that's how I know that she heard everything that happened. She never said a word. And while we were waiting for that train, tears welled up in her eyes. And I could see she was really fighting just to hold it back, and her face got very red. She'd been hurt by what she'd heard. We got in the train. The couple sat next to me, and I spoke with them, and they were really a really nice couple. They were not malicious. I don't think there was a malicious intent. It was just a very unconscious thing that, that they had done with themselves. And in that moment, what I knew was that the three of us had had a rare opportunity. The woman had had the opportunity to hear herself judged, the couple had had the opportunity to judge someone else, and I had the opportunity to witness. Both of these stories illustrate the seventh scene mystery of relationship. And it's the mystery of allowing for perfection in the imperfections of life. The young woman that lost her life, my question is, what standard was she holding herself accountable to that made her feel that she was imperfect and must change the body that she was given in this life to, to accommodate? What standard? What did she use as a yardstick? The couple that saw this large woman, me describing her as a large woman, to you right now, until you compare your experience or your life to an external reference, how can it be anything other than perfect? And my question to you is to please be aware of what it is that you hold yourself accountable to. What do you use as your yardstick in life? How do you know when you've succeeded or failed at something in life? I could share with you a sheet. We could do this. I could give you a sheet, and I could give you a list of criteria, and I could say, Tell me about your athletic capabilities, your academic capabilities, your capabilities in communication, in romance. That's always a good one. Are you a good lover? Tell me about all these things. 
And I'd give you about 15 seconds to give me an answer because it doesn't make any difference what you answer. If you see yourself as anything other than perfect, what have you compared yourself to? How do you know that you are doing anything other than perfection until you reference outside of yourself? We were talking about this yesterday. I went back in, into the video room to see what this tape looked like. And they were reluctant to let me see it because there was a sense that I may judge myself on the screen. As I live this mirror, if I am giving you the best I can do in this moment until I compare myself to someone else, this is perfect and this is what this moment is. This is, for the Essenes, the most subtle because we are so quick to judge ourselves and we are our own most difficult judges. So what I'll say to you is I'll invite you to look at your life Look at the places in your life where you sense that you're not happy with yourself. The only way that can happen is if you've not done your best or if you have done your best and you've compared it to someone else. What do you use as your yardstick? In our culture, what is our yardstick? We're compared to this man. You know what this man said when he was here? He said, you think the things I'm doing now are cool. Wait till you see what you're about to do in 2,000 years. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He said, don't, don't hold me. Don't hold me on the pedestal. He said, you are far, far greater than I as you realize the power that lives within you. The power of thought, feeling, and emotion and what you'll do with it. So that's the seventh Essene mirror of relationship, the mirror of perfection. Well, these seven mirrors of relationship, powerful mirrors, powerful insights into why we have lived the kinds of lives and had the relationships that we have had. The Essenes remind us that we will all go through each of these mirrors at some point in our lives, whether we recognize them or not. Often we'll go through many mirrors simultaneously. That's the masters that we are, and that's the masters that we become in this lifetime, is that we move through the mirrors and we move forward with life each day without, possibly without even recognizing why we're doing these things. Well, it would be nice to have a beautiful neon sign flash to us first thing in the morning and say, on this day, after you finished your breakfast and after you sent the family off on their day, you may begin your dark night of the soul. And the reality is that life does not happen to us in that way. We're invited to know ourselves in the presence of others through our relationships. And as those relationships are reconciled, we become the benefit of that healing. And it is that benefit that we carry with us through the waking dream of life as we walk between the worlds of heaven and earth. And this story is a story directly about Jesus of Nazareth and healing. And the story tells uh, of a, a particular woman that he worked with one day and how he chose to respond to her requests. As we read these texts, it's interesting. Um, what I've discovered is that uh, not every single person that sought the help of Jesus was healed. They he would ask them two questions. Depending on how they answered those questions, they may or may not have the benefit of the healing. The first one... He would ask, he'd say, do you believe in me? Do you believe in my father? At that point in his life, he made no distinction between himself and his father in heaven. Think about that. No distinction. In our language, our language based in separation, as the translations were made, what, what's the most powerful prayer that we've been offered in the West, what we believe? What, what's, when you ask someone about a prayer, typically what prayer did they... Okay, and listen to how that was answered. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Who's Lord? The Essene traditions call it our Lord's Prayer. What is the first sentence of that prayer? Complete sentence. Who art in heaven. That's the Western translation. Our Father who art in heaven. There's the separation. Our Father's in heaven and we're down here somewhere. That's not the way the original Aramaic traditions read. They say our Father who is everywhere. Our Father who is everywhere. 
So our language plays such a potent role, and that's why I'll invite you to explore many paths as we're looking at the language. Well, it was through this language that I read of, um, of this story. He would ask him, do you believe in me? Do you believe in my father? Because at that point in his life, he saw only the union of the two. And the person would say yes or no. Then he would ask him a question. He'd say, what have you learned in your illness? What have you learned in your illness? Typically, the, there were illnesses that people were asking to be healed of. And this particular story uh, fascinates me because it was a woman that was born with leprosy. We don't see a lot of leprosy today, and, and there was a lot uh, in this country anyway we don't see a lot. This woman had been born with leprosy, and she was angry at her disease. She said, what do you mean, what have I learned? I've learned nothing. This is a mistake. I'm not supposed to have this. She says, I am so hideous, I've never had a friend. I've never known a man. I'm so hideous, even the animals cower in my presence. Heal me of this affliction. And he said to her, if you have learned nothing from your condition, then die and know yourself through death because he loved her that much. And that is the beginning of compassion. He had no attachment to the outcome. He could have felt a lot of peer pressure. He could have been there on the shores of Galilee and said, okay, there's 10,000 people behind me. There's a woman in front of me. They're asking me to do something. I gotta do something quick. I mean, he could have had a thought process like that, and he didn't. He loved her. She had, from this perspective, through her mastery, allowed or created that condition in her life so that she may know herself in that way. If it had not served her, why would he take that away from her? Thought without attachment to the outcome. Uh, a few years ago, we had the opportunity on the 6 o'clock news, many of our homes, to witness a, a tragedy that has happened uh, far too many times, once is too many, uh, this particular tragedy was in a, a small country of Rwanda where uh, approximately 10,000, we still don't even know the exact number, 10,000 civilians were depicted uh, on the news, massacred by their own people on the rural roadsides in that country. And I was with a group of friends that evening and we watched this and it was just the right group of friends for that evening because I had the opportunity to look around, there were four of us, and I had the opportunity to look at the other three and see what had happened with them. So as the reports went on, there was a woman that was in the living room, and I asked her, I said, how do you feel about this? She, she was enraged. She said, this is ridiculous. She was pounding her fist on the coffee table. A lot of fist pounding in these, in these stories. She said, when are we going to stop this? When are we going to send the Marines to kill the soldiers that killed the civilians so there isn't any, any more of this going on? Why don't we stop this? There was another uh, gentleman who was in the living room. And uh, he had just kind of gotten into the New Age thoughts. And I asked him what he felt about it. And he said, about what? Rwandans? He said, they knew that was going to happen. He said, that was their karma. They knew on some level when they came in this lifetime, they were going to die that way. And uh, he said, there really is no death anyway. It's about 6 o'clock. You want to get a bite to eat? And he felt nothing. And there was a third woman who'd gotten up and walked into the kitchen. And I followed her in and I said, what did this program mean to you, what you saw tonight? And she turned around, she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I don't know. She said, I don't want the soldiers to die because that's the same kind of thinking that led to the deaths in the first place. Um, she said, I don't think we should go in and, and uh, send in the Marines and I just don't want any more people to die. She said, I miss those people, even though I never knew them. I feel different in my world because I know now that they're no longer here. That's the beginning of compassion. The first woman was in polarity. She was angry. She was in the same polarity that allowed that tragedy in the first place. The second gentleman was in denial. What he had seen hurt him on such a deep level, he did not allow himself to feel it. So he rationalized it away. And the third woman allowed herself to feel, and in doing so, opened the path to the possibility of compassion. How do you know if you're in denial or lovingly detached? You can ask yourself a simple question. If you feel nothing, 
When you witness an outrage or a tragedy such as this, there's a good possibility that it has hurt you on such a deep level that you are in denial. If you feel for what has occurred and you're not seeking retribution, not trying to get even, or send the, the mentality that somebody's got to pay, then you're, um, you're not in the polarity. You're allowing yourself to feel what has happened. And if you can say to yourself, I miss those people, and this didn't have to happen, and there's a sense that somehow there's a balance that's occurred here, you may be at the path, at the doorway, to what we call compassion in our lives. This is a completion for our animal story that I began yesterday. My little friend Merlin, somebody said, well, what, are you going to tell us whatever happened to Merlin? Where is Merlin? And, and I'll share that with you now because it, uh, it's been a, a really powerful part of my life and, uh, and it is very relevant uh, to, to make concrete these sometimes nebulous concepts that we're, we're describing here. Well, I got all the things I needed to take Merlin across country, and Merlin and I had a great adventure uh, from Mount Shasta all the way to northern New Mexico. And uh, uh, we live about uh, six miles from the, uh, the Colorado border, so we're in a very high mountainous area. And, uh, and Merlin grew to be a, a very healthy, vigorous, uh, beautiful, uh, large black male cat. Uh, not a speck of any other color on him. He was completely black. And a very good friend. Merlin, if you've ever read uh, the book Awakening the Zero Point, he was right there on the, uh, on the table with me as I wrote each evening. And every once in a while he'd get up and stretch and he'd walk across the keyboard. <laughs> and sometimes he'd type words that made sense. And I'd have to read those. So if you saw a lot of typos in that book, I'd like to say Merlin helped me with those. And, uh, and Merlin used to go out every single day. We'd let him out uh, first thing in the morning, and his, his rule was he had to come back in by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and he did that for several years. There was one day Merlin went outside, and he didn't come back. And um, at first, I wasn't too concerned about that. I thought, well, uh, maybe it's just a kiddie walkabout. You know, it's a male thing. He was going to explore this, this territory in, in northern New Mexico. And by the time the second day, rolled around, I was a little concerned, and I really felt something was, was happening. And uh, by the third day, I knew something had gone wrong from my perspective at that time. And, uh, and I stopped everything I was doing. I returned no phone calls, no correspondence. I did no business. And for, uh, for five solid days, uh, I invited friends in our valley and we looked for, uh, for Mr. Merlin everywhere. We looked in coyote dens. We looked in owl nests. We looked in badger's burrows where we could find them. We went uh, and looked around eagle's nests uh, down in the, in the valley. We, there's 136,000 acres of sage that borders our property, owned by a Bureau of Land Management. It's fenced off, and we'd walk from one end to the other and tie off a piece of ribbon, take three steps over and walk back so we could scour every every foot of the fields. And after a few days, um, I, I really had this, uh, this feeling inside that something was terribly wrong. And I, I felt like he was alive and maybe he'd fallen into a well and needed some help, or he was in an old uh, abandoned building, or he was in a hunter's trap, or something had happened. And, uh, and one morning as I was laying in bed, uh, the sun had not come up yet, and it was light. It was about to come up. And I asked for a sign, and I simply said, uh, Father, I asked for the sign. Is my friend Merlin alive? Does he need me, or, or what's happened? And I didn't even get the sentence out of my mind. I hadn't even finished that sentence yet, and something happened. It had never happened before. It's never happened since. Uh, from 360 degrees all around our property, I heard more coyotes yip and yell and scream and cry, broad daylight, and then as soon as they, uh, just as suddenly as they began, they stopped. And I, I knew in that moment that Merlin was no longer with me. And, uh, and that he'd been taken by a coyote. Well, I got up that morning, drove a truck down the road, and something very odd began to happen. There were coyotes everywhere in broad daylight. There were young ones and old ones, and they were walking in twos and threes. They walked in the road right in front of my truck. They were all over my property. And normally, you'd only see them... Uh, 
maybe very early in the morning or at dusk. You, you typically do not see them in broad daylight. And I had an opportunity in that moment. Uh, and if it had happened at another point in my life, I, I may have been very angry at every coyote. I, I may have chosen to uh, stand on top of one of my buildings and snipe each one and said, maybe you're the one that took my friend Merlin. And I didn't feel that way. I, I, I didn't want the coyotes to lose their lives. I missed my friend Merlin and his presence. I missed his life. And in that choice of not being angry at those coyotes while still allowing for the emotion of losing my friend, for me, that was uh, a powerful opportunity and an opening into compassion. Thought without attachment to the outcome, feeling without distortion, emotion without charge. It hurt me deeply. He was a very, very close friend. And I, I share animal stories, and maybe to some people they're kind of silly, and uh, if you have ever been alone in your life, or uh, I've never had any children. Uh, animals have essentially been children, and they've been powerful teachers to me, really powerful teachers.